All right, if you would, open your Bible today to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I'd like to speak to you once again out of this chapter. This chapter is a great chapter of faith. That's one thing that everybody in Hebrews 11 have is faith. And in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 1, 2, and 3, Paul gives us a definition of faith. And Paul is writing about Hebrews here in chapter 11. And he's writing about these people in Hebrews 11. He mentions them out of the Old Testament because the people he's writing to, the Hebrews, they're familiar with all of these men and women that Paul mentions in chapter 11 of Hebrews. They're very familiar with these people. And Paul reminds them of the great faith they had. And Paul reminds them of the fact that they had this great faith and remained true to the faith under the same circumstances that they were experiencing. When Paul wrote Hebrews, the people, the Hebrews that he wrote this epistle to were suffering persecution. It was undergoing in their life right then and there. And the people he mentions in chapter 11, many of them suffer persecution, just like them. But those people in Hebrews 11 remained true to the faith. They kept believing God in spite of all the obstacles and persecution and trouble they had as an example to the people, the Hebrews he's writing to. Verse 1, he said, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen <clears throat> were not made of things which do appear. <coughs> now Paul said here that faith is the substance of things hoped for. What does that mean? Well, it means that our faith is our confidence and assurance that the things God promised us in heaven are real. In other words, the things we hope for in that verse are in heaven. And we're confident, we're sure they're real even though we've never seen them. <clears throat> Our faith makes these invisible things a reality to us. <coughs> and then he said, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Now you know evidence is used to prove a fact or make a statement. We believe the evidence that God gave us of the things we've never seen. <clears throat> Even though we've never seen the things <clears throat> that we hope for in heaven, the evidence that God gives us in His Word convinces us and assures us that those things are real. See, faith believes the evidence <clears throat> that God gives of invisible things even though we've never seen it with our physical eyes. Now, the first man that Paul mentioned in the list is Abel. He said, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now, Abel had what I call saving faith. You know, God gave Cain and Abel a time and a place and a means by which they could get their sins forgiven. There was a time and a place and a means, and the means was through a blood sacrifice. Abraham, I should say Abel, believed God. And he brought an animal sacrifice at the right time and the right place. And God accepted the sacrifice he brought and his sins were forgiven. His brother Cain didn't believe God. Now Cain knew, just like Abel, there was a right place, time, and means to get sins forgiven. But Cain ignored what God said. And he brought a sacrifice... And the sacrifice he brought was the fruit of the ground, the things that he grew in his garden. He thought that God would accept that sacrifice. And God rejected Cain. He rejected his sacrifice. Why? 
no blood. See, Cain is one of these people who thinks that you can atone for your own sins by the good works you do in your life. That's Cain's religion. You know what? That religion is still with us today. There are millions and billions of people today like Cain. They think God will accept all the good works they do in their life as an atonement for their sins. And God does not do it. He rejects their works just like he rejected Cain's work. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Somebody has got to die and pay for your sins for God to forgive them. Abel believed that, brought the right sacrifice, and he was forgiven. Cain did not believe it. His sacrifice was rejected. And you know what? He got mad about it, didn't he? Got so mad he killed his brother Abel. That's the first murder in your Bible. Cain killing Abel over a religious issue. Abel believed what God said. He believed in a sacrificial offering. He believed in blood atonement. Cain did not believe it. That's why he persecuted him. You got the same people today, folks. You got folks today, like Abel. They believe that sin is atoned for by the death and shed blood of Christ. But you've got billions of people who don't believe that, and the ones who don't believe it persecute those who do believe it, like you and I. Good example of the Muslims. They're just like Cain. They believe in self-atonement. They believe you atone for your own sins by the works you do in this life, and they despise anybody, like Abel today, that believes in a blood sacrifice. So he had saving faith, Abel did. Verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now we know the story. Enoch had what I call rewarding faith. God made a promise to Enoch and the promise was that Enoch, if you walk with me I reward you. I reward you with a great reward of taking you out of this world without you having to die. And that's exactly what happened. He not believed what God said. He claimed the promise. He walked with God 300 years. And then one day, he vanished. He was gone, caught up into heaven without dying. And so far, Enoch is the only man that has ever left this planet without dying. He's in heaven right now. He's very much alive. He never died. That was the reward of his faith. Verse 6, But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's a great verse on faith. You know, faith is more than just believing what God says, but faith, true faith, is, is reacting or responding positively to what God says. See, Abel <clears throat> heard God say, if you want your sins forgiven, you've got to offer an animal sacrifice. He heard it, he believed it, but he acted positively by bringing the sacrifice. Had he just believed what God said without responding by bringing the sacrifice, his sins would never have been forgiven. Faith is more than believing what God says. It's responding positively to what God says. You know, you and I today, we've heard all our lives, most of us, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, raised again. We've heard that. I believe that since I was a child. But I did not respond positively to that message until I was 21 years old. That's when I trusted the sacrifice that Christ made for me to save me. I responded positively. That's what true faith is. Now the next man we're going to look at is in verse 7, Noah. But before we look at Noah, I want to talk to you. Go back, if you would, to the book of Genesis. And I want you to look at Genesis chapter 5. We're going to look at a man here who lived before Noah. As a matter of fact, this man here lived between Enoch and Noah. He connects Enoch this man here connects Enoch with Noah. He spans that, that period of time between Enoch and Noah. Genesis chapter 5. 
Genesis chapter 5, 21. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God, underline it, after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. And Methuselah lived 187 years and begat Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 782 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. And Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son. <clears throat> and he called his name Noah, saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands, because the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Now, I want you to notice in verse 22 here that Enoch began to walk with God when he begat Methuselah. Not before, <clears throat> but after he begat Methuselah, he began to walk with God. Now, when you see what the name Methuselah means, you'll understand why he began to walk with God. <coughs> the name means, Methuselah the name means, when he is dead, it shall come. When he is dead, it shall come. You see, God revealed something to Enoch. He revealed to Enoch that when his son died, Methuselah, something extraordinary was going to come to pass. And that which came to pass when he died was the flood. It was the flood. You see, Enoch knew the flood was coming. And when his son died, he knew he knew the flood was coming. <clears throat> when his son died, that's why he named him Methuselah. You see, Enoch is a very special person in the Bible. Enoch not only prophesied of the second coming of Christ, which he did, according to Jude one fourteen, But his son Methuselah, the name that he gave him, prophesied of the coming flood in Noah's day. That's another reason Enoch was such a godly man and why he walked with God for 300 years. Enoch prophesied of the two major catastrophes in history. He prophesied of the worldwide flood in Noah's day, and he prophesied of the second coming of Christ. And folks, the flood came in Noah's day in the year that Methuselah died. That very year when Methuselah died, that's when the flood came. And you see, Methuselah, when you think about it, lived in the days of Noah. And we're going to look at those days in just a minute. He lived during the days of Noah. He saw how wicked the world was. And the year he died, that flood came. And you know, for as long as Methuselah was alive, his name was a witness and a warning that God would destroy the world with a flood when he died. That's why he lived so long. See that? He lived longer than any man in the Bible because God was long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. You see, as long as Methuselah was alive, there was a chance for the people out there to repent and believe God and be saved. And if they did, God would have withheld the flood and the work on the ark would have ceased and maybe Noah would open up a Motel 6 with it or something, but... During the time, during the life of Methuselah, <clears throat> the people were aware of his name. And they knew that that name meant that when he dies, something terrible is going to come. Everybody knew about it. And if they would have taken it serious, if they would have considered that when this man dies, a bad thing is going to come, if they would have believed that, repented and believed God, then there would have never been a flood. And the ark would have would the work of the ark would have ceased right then and there. But of course we know that they didn't repent, did they? They paid no attention 
to the name of that boy Methuselah. But as long as he lived, that was long suffering. That's why God allowed that boy to live so long. Nine hundred. How many years is it? Uh, Nine hundred. Uh, Yeah, uh, verse 27. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years. So 969 years during that boy's lifetime, that's how many years, that's the long-suffering of God, that's the chance that God gave the, na the world to repent and believe God back there. And over 900 years, that was God's long-suffering. But they didn't listen, did they? Paid no attention. Now, keep your hand here in Genesis. And go back to Hebrews 11. And let's look at the faith of Noah. Hebrews 11, 7. Hebrews 11, 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now let's look at Noah for a moment. Look back to Genesis chapter 6. Let's look at this man Noah, his background, what conditions were like in the world when he lived. Genesis chapter 6, 1, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, and yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare their children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now you notice here that the giants were the offspring of these sons of God when they went into the daughters of men. Well, these sons of God were angels. That's who they are. They were fallen angels. Sometimes the Bible, angels are called sons of God. These are fallen angels. And they came down to the earth and cohabitated with women. And they had children, and the children were the giants. There were giants in the earth in those days. The giants were the offspring of fallen angels. That's where the giants came from. And by the way, those, it says these giants became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. They were very famous men. By the way, all the, you know, all these in Greek mythology, you read about all these gods and idols and all that, these different men. That's where that mythology came from. It's from, a, it's from these giants. These giants were famous men. They were big, tremendous, powerful men. Demon possessed. But all Greek mythology is based upon the lives of those giants back here that were the offspring of fallen angels in, in Noah's day. The whole earth was corrupt. You can see it here. Verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination, the thoughts of his heart, was only evil continually. And he repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and <clears throat> it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I made him. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now here's why he found grace, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. It says he was perfect in his generations. In other words, <coughs> his children did not corrupt themselves with these fallen angels. He was perfect in his generations. He was a just man, perfect in his generations, and he walked with God, and that's why God was gracious to Noah and his family. Verse 12, well, verse um, 10, And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You know, folks, every race of man today on this planet can be traced back to one of those three sons right there. 
Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The Jews came from Shem. The black people today trace their genealogy back to Ham and the Gentiles, like you and I, most of us trace our genealogy back to Japheth. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Those are the three races of men today. Every person alive today can trace their genealogy back to one of those three men right there. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth, make thee an ark of gopher wood, room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And he tells him how to build it. Look at chapter 7. And the Lord said to Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Uh, verse 5, And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day, that is the day that the fountains of the deep were broken up, the flood came. In the selfsame day entered Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. And down in verse 21 it says, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. Now, this man Noah, his faith, the, Noah, the faith that Noah had is an example of how Paul defines faith in verse 1 and 2. Faith is a substance and reality and confidence we have of things we hope for in heaven we've never seen. It's the evidence of unseen things. Well, Noah was warned about something that he and no one else ever witnessed. He was warned about a coming worldwide flood that would destroy the whole earth. And even though no one had ever witnessed a universal flood, he believed what God said. And the proof that he believed God was the ark that he built. You see, the ark was a testimony and the evidence of the faith that Noah had. By building the ark, we can see that Noah believed God concerning things not seen as yet. So the ark was a testimony of his faith, but it was also a warning to the world of things to come. The ark was both a symbol of Noah's faith, but that ark was also a constant reminder and warning to the world that wrath was coming. Wrath was coming. And you know what? Every day, <clears throat> when the men and women of that day when they looked at that ark that Noah was building, what they saw was a literal, physical, visible warning that God would destroy them if they did not repent and believe God like Noah did. Every day they saw that ark, they saw a warning that what God would do to them. And you know, they not only saw a visible warning upcoming wrath, but they heard it from the mouth of Noah also. Look, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2 in your Bible. 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. It says here, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. And by the way, those angels right there are those sons of God back in Genesis 6. We just read about them. And deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment 
and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, watch it, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now you see what it says about Noah? He was a preacher of righteousness. He was a preacher. He not only built boats, but he preached when he built. I've always thought it was kind of funny that professionals built the Titanic, amateurs built the ark. And look what happened. <laughs> now, this message that Noah preached was a revelation that God gave him concerning the coming flood. It was a message of coming wrath and destruction. God told Noah that he would bring a flood of waters upon the earth and that that flood would destroy all flesh wherein was the breath of life. And so the message that Noah preached was a message of universal death and destruction with no survivors but just he and his family. That's the message. Now you can imagine that that message was very unpleasant. It didn't appeal to the flesh. His message was not received by anyone. And no doubt, he was ridiculed. He was hated. The message was very controversial. His message was very upsetting. And you know what? There were no converts. He didn't convert anybody. <clears throat> but even though Noah was hated and despised for what he preached, Noah kept believing what he preached for many years before the flood came. He preached years before the flood came while he built the ark. His faith caused him to fear. That's why I say that Noah's faith is a faith of fear, a fearing faith. In other words, he feared God. He heard the warning. He feared God. And his faith and fear moved him to build the ark, to save his family from the death and destruction that he preached about. He was moved with fear. His faith caused him to fear. <clears throat> and that fear caused him to build the ark, and the ark saved him. So he had a fearing faith. You know, true, genuine faith, that's what it does. It will produce fear inside your heart. I know that I got, night I got saved, I had an awful dread and fear of dying and going to hell. I got under a terrible conviction. That's what true faith does. It'll put the fear of God in your heart of coming wrath. And his faith is what saved him. His faith and fear is what saved him. And you know what? That's what happens today when a man gets saved, a woman. Their faith and their fear is what saves them. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about Noah. But one thing it has to say about Noah is, is Noah and his attachment to the second coming. You see, history got a way of repeating itself, right? What is said about Noah and the flood in the past is a warning of future events. And if you want to know the future, read the past, okay? The days of Noah before the flood are preview of the last days that precede the second coming of Christ. Look, if you would, to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, look what the Lord said here. Matthew 24, 37. The Lord said right here, Matthew 24, 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came, took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, what the Lord is showing us right here in these verses is that during those years that Noah preached and warned people of the coming flood, during those years, life went on as usual. They ate, they drank as usual, they married, were given in marriage as usual. Everything just went on normally. And what that shows you 
about those people back there in Noah's day is that they did not believe the warnings of Noah. <clears throat> they were not converted by the ark. And they had no fear of a coming flood. They ignored it and went on with their lives as usual. And when that flood came, it caught them by surprise. It was sudden and unexpected. I mean, that flood came when Noah went on that ark that day. <clears throat> but until that very day, the people ignored what it said, went about their lives as they always did. And when the flood came, they were totally surprised. Caught them off guard. But you know what? That's a preview of things to come concerning Christ's second coming. Today, very few people believe in a second coming of Christ. Most people don't believe He came the first time, much less the second. But it's not because I have not been born, because folks, for nearly 2,000 years now, this world has been warned over and over again about the second coming of Christ. And they have been told over and over again <clears throat> that day is going to be a day of salvation and a day of wrath, just like the flood was in Noah's day. This world has been told that when the Lord comes, He will save His people first, just like He saved Noah first. <clears throat> and then He will rain down fire from heaven and destroy all those left behind as He rained down water from heaven and destroyed all the people outside the ark in Noah's day. See, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. <coughs> and when it comes, when that wrath, that fire comes, it will catch a world by surprise. And that's why the Lord says here in Matthew 24, He says, For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. That's why He said, Be ye also ready. Be ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Lord cometh. That bunch back there in Noah's day, they paid no attention to Noah's preaching. They ignored the ark, probably laughed about that big boat he was building. They laughed about it. They ridiculed it. And life went on as usual, as normal. They laughed at Noah. You know, they said, well, this is this kook, this kook down here building the boat. And he's, he's telling everybody a big old flood's going to come. And they all had a big laugh. And that very day that Noah went on that ark, stepped on in the ark, what happened? God shut him in. And the Bible says the foundations of in heaven open and that flood came down and can you imagine the reaction of those people back there when that water came no escape and every last one of them died and we're talking about millions of people millions just Noah and his family were saved from the wrath of that day and that's exactly the way it's going to be in the future of Christ coming this world has been told and warned when Jesus comes two things are going to happen he's going to save his people first and if you're left behind, you will be destroyed by fire. But you know what? They're not listening, are they? Because we know that probably, it's probably less than 8 or 9% of people in the world today are truly saved. Probably 91, 92% of people in the world today do not believe the gospel, certainly don't believe in a second coming or coming wrath. They don't believe it. And when that wrath comes, they will be caught off guard, sudden and unexpected. Look over, you would, to uh, 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter uh, 3. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? That's Christ's second coming. In other words, they don't believe He's coming. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That's the flood in Genesis 6. But the heavens of the earth, which are now, this one, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not in this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years of one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, 
Verse 9 tells you why Jesus hadn't come yet. He hadn't come because He's long-suffering. <clears throat> just like His long, just like as long as Methuselah was alive, they had a chance to be saved. That was the long-suffering of God before the flood. Today, God's Son hadn't come yet. Why? To give this world a chance to repent and believe and be saved. That's why He hadn't come. Because once He comes, folks, this Katie bar the door. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. When does a thief come? Unexpected. He comes unexpected. And when He comes, He comes as a surprise. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, just like the flood did, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening in the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire <coughs> shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with perfect heat. Nevertheless, we according to His promise look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. You know, these verses just simply tell us that history has a way of repeating itself, doesn't it? In the days of Noah, <clears throat> God destroyed the world with a flood of water because of the wickedness of man. In these verses, there's a warning that God will destroy this world the second time, but this time with fire, with fire when Jesus comes. The second coming of Christ and the events leading up to the second coming will be like the flood in Noah's day. God will destroy the world with fire in the future for the same reason He destroyed it with water in Noah's day. It will be universal destruction in the future just like it was in Noah's day. And when Jesus comes in fire, that will come upon men suddenly, unexpectedly, as it did in the days of Noah. And those who shall be destroyed by fire will be without excuse, just like those folks who drowned in the flood in Noah's day. God will save His people from the wrath that will fall on the lost, as He saved Noah and his family from the wrath that came on the lost in His day. And you know what? After God destroys the world with fire, He will create new heavens and a new earth just like He did after the flood in Noah's day. You know, God had to create the... He had to recreate this world back there when Noah stepped off the ark. I mean, He could not step off into devastation. I mean, how could He live? No, God did something to the earth back there. He rejuvenated the earth when Noah stepped off of it. Well, if Jesus is going to burn this thing up when He comes, then it's got to be created again, and He will. Just like it was in the days of Noah. So Noah is quite a character in your Bible. He believed things that no one had ever witnessed. God warned him of a coming flood. There had never been one before. Noah took God serious, responded positively, built an ark. His family got on the ark. When the flood came, he was saved. Those who ignored what he said drowned and went to hell. That's the way it was. Eight people only were saved in that day. Smiled in it. Well, you know what? That, isn't that a preview of things to come? Jesus said, Narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Just a few. Now, go back to Hebrews 11, and I want to talk to you next about Abraham's faith. And this is somewhat unusual. This man Abraham, what God says about him. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 and 9. Now, here's a man that's famous for faith, isn't he? Abraham. Father Abraham. I can still see Rachel singing that song. She used to sing that to the kids there across the street and to vacation Bible school and these Sunday school classes. Father Abraham. But when we talk about the faith of Abraham, what I see in him is what I call an expanding faith. His faith was stretched. He expanded his faith. Here's what I mean by that. Hebrews 11.8 By faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, 
not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Now, folks, God promised Abraham the land of Canaan as an inheritance, right? But yet he lived like he had no inheritance in it. He did not have a permanent dwelling place. He did not have a permanent house. Matter of fact, he owned no property in the land of Canaan. Instead, he lived in tents and tabernacles. He lived as if he was a stranger and a foreigner in the land of Canaan that God gave him by promise. Now, why is that? Why would he live like a stranger and a foreigner in a land that God promised him? Why? Verse 10. Here's why. For he looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Verse 10 explains Abraham's behavior in verse 89. And it appears from this verse that God offered Abraham a better inheritance than the land of Canaan that it promised him at the beginning. He offered him an inheritance in a city in heaven that he built. Look at verse 13. These all died in the faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them before all, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that there were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things <coughs> declare plainly that they seek a country. And you know what? The way they said such things was by living like strangers and pilgrims of the earth. In other words, by living, by, by living like strangers and pilgrims of the earth, they were saying something. They were saying that I'm expecting something better. Verse 15, And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from which they came out, they might have an opportunity to return. But now they, here it is, desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. Now you see what God offered Abraham back there? <clears throat> he gave him the land of promise as inheritance. And yet, he began to live like he had no inheritance in the land. Why? Because God offered him something better. God offered him a better inheritance in a heavenly country, a heavenly city. And what was that city that God offered Abraham back there? The one in heaven is New Jerusalem. Look at chapter 12. The same book, chapter 12. 22, but you have come into Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an unnewable company of angels, and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speak a better thing than that of Abel. Now what Paul does here, he gives us an idea of the people who occupy a heavenly city, New Jerusalem. This is the same city that Abraham looked forward to in Hebrews chapter 11. It's that heavenly city, New Jerusalem. And Paul said if you could look in there today, you would see an, you would see an innumerable company of angels. There's so many angels in that city, you can't count them. God the Father is there. <clears throat> the spirits of just men made perfect are there. Who is that? That's the dead in Christ. You've got friends and relatives in that city. <clears throat> and you would find Jesus Christ, the mediator of the New Testament, in that city. Now John described the city in detail, doesn't he? Revelation 20, 21, 22. He shows you the beauty of that city, the gates of the city, the foundation walls of the city. It's, big, it's 1,500 miles square. It's in the heavens right now. <clears throat> Abraham knew about that back in the book of Genesis. And he chose that over the previous inheritance that God gave him. Now, now what we have 
What you see here in Hebrews 11 is what we call the law of subsequent, subsequent revelation. The law of subsequent revelation. What that means is this. Paul reveals something <clears throat> about Abraham in Hebrews 11 that is not recorded back in Genesis when he actually lived. We learn here in Hebrews that God offered Abraham and the saints a better inheritance in a heavenly city and they believed what God said and responded to His promise in a positive way by living like strangers and foreigners and pilgrims on the earth. So you see, their faith grew and expanded from what it was in the beginning. In the beginning, they entered into the land of promise to live in forever. But then God came along and offered them a better inheritance in a heavenly city, and their faith expanded from an earthly inheritance to a heavenly inheritance. In other words, God offered them something better than what they had, and they chose the better. So you might say that Abraham and them had a choice. They could either claim the land of Canaan, live there forever, or they could make a second choice to live in that heavenly city, New Jerusalem. But to live in that city, New Jerusalem, they had to live like strangers and pilgrims in the previous inheritance. And we know the choice that he made. He made the choice. I want the better. I want to live in that city, not this one down here. And we know he made the choice by living like a stranger down here because he was looking for something better up there. See? His faith expanded. Now, <clears throat> do you know the same thing can be said of you and I today? Look, if you would, to, um, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and look at verse 11 and 12. Second Timothy 2, verse 11 and 12. He said here, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him, Christ. If we suffer, we shall also, something else, also reign with Him. Now, we're given a choice right here of just living with Christ in the kingdom of God, verse 11, or also reign with Christ in the kingdom of God, verse 12. Now, all saints will live with Christ in the coming kingdom of God. That's guaranteed. All will live with Him. But the saints who choose to reign with Christ instead of just living with Christ they're going to have more, so to speak. In other words, if we choose to reign and live with Him, not just live with Him, but reign with Him, we must suffer for Him in this life. Now, some people's faith today is limited to just living with Christ in the kingdom of God. But some people, they want to also reign with Him. Their faith is greater than those who just choose to live with Him. But to reign with Christ requires us to suffer for Christ in this life. I hope you all can understand or see what I'm saying here. You see, uh, you can live with Christ out there in the coming kingdom, but you can also do more. You can have more. You can also reign with Him. Living and reigning with Him. Some people choose to live with Him only. But some people make that choice and say, I not only want to live with Him out there, I want to reign with Him as a king. Okay? To do that, Paul said, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. Now, <clears throat> when we think about suffering, we think about something physical. Being shot, cut up, beaten, burned alive, buried alive. And of course, that's what's happening right now in the Middle East. A lot of Christians, thousands of them, are losing their lives. They're being beaten up physically for the sake of Christ. But you know, folks, all suffering is not physical. It's not all physical. Turn the Bible, if you would, to Matthew 5 and Luke 6. We'll end up here, Matthew 5 and Luke 6. And I want you to notice something here. In Matthew chapter 5, 
And I want you to notice how the Lord defines suffering in these verses. Matthew 5.10 Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now notice what this persecution is. Verse 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, and shall persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Do you see what the persecution is here? It's being reviled. It's being lied about. Verse 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Persecution, these verses we've read here, are not physical. It's men reviling you. It's men speaking evil against you and lying about you falsely. <clears throat> Look at Luke 6. Luke chapter 6, 22. Notice the persecution here. Luke 6, 22. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy for behold, your reward is great in heaven for in like manner did they the fathers on the prophets. Again, notice the persecution here. <clears throat> it's when you're hated by men. It's when they separate you, cut you off from their company, and reproach you, and cast out your name as something evil. That's not physical. In other words, that's not getting beaten up with, bully, with, with a billy club or being shot or knife, no. It's when men hate you. They hate you for your stand in Christ. <clears throat> they cut you off from their company. They don't want you around them. And they reproach you and cast out your name as something evil. In other words, when they use your name, they'll use it as a cuss word. Paul said, all believers will live with Christ. But some who go the extra mile can reign with Him if they suffer. So we got a choice. We can just live with Him or we go that extra mile and stand for Christ. I tell you what, you stand for Christ in this world and live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says you will suffer persecution. You don't have to go looking for it. It'll find you, right? But the thing is, God will see to it that you're rewarded for your faith and persecution with the privilege of reigning with Christ throughout eternity. Abraham's faith. When Abraham first went into the land of Canaan, as far as he was concerned, this is my inheritance. I'm on it right now. God comes along and says, Abraham, I tell you what, I've got something better to offer you. It's better than this land right here. You're on right now. And Abraham said, well, what is that, Lord? And the Lord said to Abraham, there's a heavenly country and there's a heavenly city. I built that city. You can have live in that city. That city and that heavenly country can be your inheritance. But if you want it, if you choose that, then you must live like a stranger and a pilgrim down here. He's given a choice, <clears throat> and we know the choice he made. He said, I want the better. <clears throat> I want that heavenly inheritance. And we know he made the choice by living like a stranger and a pilgrim down here on the earth. You and I have a choice. You can merely live with Christ throughout eternity, which all believers will do, or you can also reign with Him. Living is going to be wonderful, but you know what? Reigning with Christ will be even better. So God has offered you something better than just merely living. He's offered us a chance to reign with Him as kings, but there's a condition attached. Suffer. See, with Abraham, the condition was if he want the better inheritance, then live like a stranger and a pilgrim down here. And he did. You know what? That was a lot of hassle right there, living in tents and tabernacles. He had to put up with that kind of lifestyle. But it gained him a better inheritance. You and I can have a better inheritance. That is, you can have the privilege of running with Christ, but it costs you something now, suffering now. But I tell you what, it'll be worth it all when Jesus comes and you're given the privilege of reigning with Christ as kings and priests. The faith of Abel, saving faith. 
The faith of Enoch, rewarding faith. He walked with God 300 years. <clears throat> and you know what? One day they turned around. He was gone. Disappeared. He's in heaven right now. Abraham's faith, <clears throat> he had an expanding faith. He chose the better inheritance above the other inheritance. Noah's faith was a fearful faith. His faith in what God said moved him with fear to build an ark which saved he and his family. Hebrews 11, the great chapter about faith. I hope you learned something today. And I hope that your faith... You know, folks, our faith is kind of like this, isn't it? <coughs> Sad to say, I think I kicked myself over a lack of faith more than anything else. How about you? You doubt God. Faith goes up high, goes low. Just like, you know, you just wish you could get it up here and keep it up here, right? But you know you can. you can. You can increase your faith. You can improve your faith every day by just believing God and trusting God no matter what the circumstance is in your life. See, that's what you learn in Hebrews 11. These people had some bad things happen to them, but they never gave up their faith in God. And neither should we. Let us pray. Now, Father, I do pray for all those that have heard the message today. God, help us to understand what you've written about faith in this chapter, such a wonderful chapter. And I pray that we'll make every effort in our life to increase our faith and strengthen our faith in you and your word. God, as we read your word, our faith is strengthened. As we hear it preached, our faith is increases, is strengthened. We know that you're a great God. We know you're able to do exceeding and abundantly above all we could ask or think. We know, God, with you nothing is impossible. And we see that all the way through the Bible. All the great, wonderful things you've done for your people. And God, may we believe these things <clears throat> and rely upon these things and consider these things to be true, not only about them, but true of us. God, may we trust you today more than what we did yesterday. May our faith grow and increase. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>